nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. In the glories of Mary, St. Alphonsus de la Gloria writes, Under the old law, there were two precepts concerning the birth of firstborn sons. One was that the mother was regarded as unclean and was to remain in her house for 40 days and then purify herself in the temple. The other was that the parents of the firstborn son should take him to the temple and offer him there to God. Now, on the day of her purification, then, the Blessed Virgin carried out both these precepts, though she was not bound by the law of purification, since she was still a virgin and absolutely pure. But nevertheless, her humility and her sense of obedience made her wish to go and purify herself like other mothers. Now, at the same time, she fulfilled the other precept by presenting and offering her son to the Eternal Father. Now, this is what we're going to focus on today. The feast is called the Purification of the Blessed Virgin. And we know from the, myst- from the fourth mystery, uh, fourth joyful mystery of the Rosary, we also refer to the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. But the focus here is on the sacrifice that Our Lady offers. Now, when we think about the holy sacrifice of the Mass, it's the sacrifice that Christ offers. Christ who who offers up this Mass and the priest who stands in his place sacramentally. But it is Christ who is the priest who offers this Mass. He offers himself in sacrifice for all of mankind. And he's only done it once. And yet, uh, Cardinal Journet mentions the that the presence of the sacrifice is, is, the sacrifice is not multiplied, but the presence of the sacrifice is multiplied. In, otherwise, in other words, there's just one sacrifice. But it's made present here, actually, twice today, and it's made present everywhere that Mass is celebrated today or tonight for this feast, and tomorrow and the next day. But it's not a multiplication of the Mass. It's not, a multi- or it's not a multiplication of the sacrifice. It's a multiplication of the presence of the one sacrifice. Now, Christ is the priest of this Mass and every Mass and every sacrament. But it, the difference here is that Our Lady is bringing the offering to be sacrificed for the first time. Now, you might recall on the eighth day after the Nativity, we celebrated the circumcision of the Lord. And that was the first time that he shed his precious blood as a sign of what was to come. And so now today on the 40th day, Our Lady brings, and St. Joseph, but Our Lady uh, brings her son, her firstborn son, her only son, and she, she sacrifices him in the temple. Well, let's take a look at what we mean by this. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the very office of motherhood gives mothers a special right over their children. Now, we're back to St. Alphonsus here. Thus, inasmuch as Jesus himself was innocent and did not deserve punishment, it seemed only fitting that he should not be condemned to the cross as a victim for the sins of the world, without the consent of his mother. His mother consented to this. Now, while Mary consented to his death from the moment that she became the mother of Jesus, God nevertheless wished that she should make a solemn sacrifice of herself in the temple on this day, making a solemn offering of the life of her son. Now, St. Bonaventure says that the Blessed Virgin would have gladly agreed to suffer the pains and death of her son personally. But in order to obey God, she made the great offering of the life of her Jesus, conquering the tender love she had for him, but with an excess of grief. And yet you might recall that on this feast, or at this, at this event, and we don't hear it here, but the same, the same man, Simeon, tells Our Lady that he is assigned to be contradicted and that she too, a sword, or a a sword would pierce her heart. 
And so this is also the beginnings of that devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, the seven sorrows of Mary, because her heart was pierced with seven swords of sorrow. And that also begins here. And this is, this is a sign pointing then to the passion and the death of our Lord on the cross. Just as the circumcision was a sign pointing to the shedding of his precious blood, so this, his presentation in the temple, is that offering of his whole life in sacrifice, and that Mary knows what she's doing. She's not a clueless airhead, like the song, Mary Did You Know. Mary is not a clueless airhead. She knows what she is doing. It has been revealed to her, and she knows what to expect. Now, she might not know, know all the details, but she knows what she's doing when she brings the, ch the child to the temple, handing him over. Now, by this sacrifice, back to St. Alphonsus here, by this sacrifice, and so St. Alphonsus didn't say that part about Mary, did you know, because that song wasn't written yet then. But there were other heresies back then, and he certainly countered. By this sacrifice, Mary brought herself more grief and was more generous than if she had offered to suffer in her own person all that her son was to endure. That is why we may say that she surpassed all the martyrs in generosity. So a martyr is generous. A martyr is willing to give him or herself completely to the shedding of his or her blood, you know, for, for Christ. But Mary's, Mary surpassed all the martyrs in generosity, for the martyrs offered their own lives to God, but the Blessed Virgin offered the life of her son, whom she loved and esteemed infinitely more than her own life. Now Mary not only offered Jesus to death in the temple, but she renewed that offering every moment of her life. So she was offering Jesus to death in the temple on his 40th day. And that's something for us to really wrap our minds around. So he already has been handed over to those who will hand him over. She's handing him over to, um, to the high priest who will hand him over to the Gentiles to be sacrificed in the end. So you see here the transition between the sacrifices of old and the sacrifice of, of the new, the Mass. That it is the Gentiles who carried out the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But he was handed over by the Jews. The Jews uh, from which he came but also the ones who had already always carried out the sacrifice of the lamb before. But then the, the, the ultimate sacrifice of the lamb of God would be carried out by the Gentiles. So Mary brings the gift, she hands him over, and now the Jews have 33 years to, to have him as that gift, without knowing it, other than a few, and then they will hand him over. So this is just a sign of things to come. Arnold of Chart says, the will of Mary and the will of Christ were then united so intimately that both offered up the same sacrifice. And think of a mother with her infant child, just 40 days old, how close a bond between that mother and child that they, that, and especially in this case, even more so, they have a union of wills. And so, because of that union of wills, they offered up the same sacrifice. Mary brought about with Christ, because of that union of wills, Mary brought about with Christ that one effect, namely the salvation of the world. And Jesus accomplished it by making satisfaction for our sins. Mary, by obtaining the application of this satisfaction to us, now, Jesus alone is, uh, is God with the Father and the Holy Ghost, of course. But, but Jesus is the man, God, who makes satisfaction for our sins. But Mary is the creature. She's the mother of God, but she's also a creature. She is a human. 
And she, so Jesus offers himself in satisfaction for our sins, but Mary then obtains the application of this satisfaction to us. She receives, she receives the, the satisfaction is applied to her, and so she, having handed over the gift for sacrifice, um, receive, obtains the application of that satisfaction for us. Now there's a tradition in the church that on the 40th day after childbirth, a woman would come to the church with her child. So the child would be baptized on the eighth day or around that as close as possible. But then on the 40th day, the mother would bring the child into the church for what's called the blessing of a mother after childbirth, or it's also known as the churching of women. And it is, it is a, a tradition, a custom that is, that is um, you know, persisted over the, the many, many centuries, the millennia, coming from this, from this feast. So here's a little bit on the churching of women. In the Jewish law, women for 40 days after the birth of a boy and for 80 after that of a girl were regarded as unclean and kept out of the temple and required at the end of that time to bring a lamb as a holocaust and a dove as a propitiatory sacrifice to the temple and be pronounced pure by the prayer of the priest. So that's what we see Mary and Joseph doing here. This law does not, it is true, apply to Christian women because the church has abolished the Jewish ceremonies but the church nevertheless permits them to remain absent. Well, of course, we're going back to the 1800s here. But the church permits them to remain absent from church for six weeks or so long as circumstances may require after the birth of a child in order to take care of their health. Back then, they didn't send you home the next day from the hospital. Um, we, uh, it, women took much longer with their child to um, regain their health than what seems to be acknowledged in our own day. Now this should be remembered by husbands who should see that their wives have the necessary quiet and attendance which nature requires for recovery after the birth of a child. The church desires that the, it, at the end of this time the mother following Mary's example should resort to the church to obtain the blessing of the priest to thank God for her delivery, to offer the child to God, praying with the priest for the grace to bring up her offspring in sanctity and piety. So the priest, as I remember, meets, I should have looked it up, the priest meets the mother at the door, and she comes in with a lit candle, which is like Candlemas. She comes up and, and uh, brings her child and receives a blessing. Now this comprises the churching of women, which is a very old and praiseworthy custom and should not be neglected. This practice was not instituted to prevent their being harmed by the devil, by malicious persons, or by ghosts. And it would, not be, and it would be not only a foolish fear, but a superstition to be condemned if one were to suppose that a woman were liable to harm if she should go abroad before she were churched. So we, we don't want to be superstitious about such things but that it is a blessing to follow the example of Mary, who didn't need to be purified, but to follow the example of Mary to bring your child to the church, but not to be superstitious about it. That if, if, you, were, if you were not to do so, you wouldn't be uh, in, in spiritual danger, but it's something you do to give thanks to God. The delicate health of women and of children is generally owing to having injured themselves by want of proper care and attention. So there you are. That's a little instruction on the Churching of Women from a very old book here, Goffin's Explanation of the Epistles and Gospels, which I think dates back to, well, it dates back a few hundred years. This particular copy is from 1880. So a lot has happened since then. But it would be a mistake also to say, well, with modern technology, we don't, need to do, we don't have the danger to our health. We don't need to do such things. Or, you know, with modern medical care, we don't need to do such things. Well, I think we've all learned recently that modern medical care does not provide everything. And that it's good to, it's good to continue these traditions because they provide also a spiritual benefit. 
Now we've been praying the Novena to Our Lady of Good Success, and I do need to make a little bit of a correction. I, was, I found out this morning from someone that uh, the, the, the title Our Lady of Good Success is from the Spanish uh, Our Lady uh, of Buen Suceso de la Purificación, which means Our Lady of Good of something to the effect of Our Lady the Good Event of the Purification, which the focus of which then has to do with, um, well, it has to do with a couple things. First of all, the purification of, of our times, because in 1599 and 1610 and 1611 and 1634 and probably some other times, Our Lady of, uh, of Buen Suceso, appeared to Mother Mariana in Quito, Ecuador, and she told her that the late 20th century would be a time of lots of trouble in the church, lots of trouble in the religious orders, uh, a relaxation of disciplines, uh, um, and, uh, and that she, when things got so bad that they couldn't seem to get any worse, then she would uh, come and begin the purification and that she would triumph and there would be a time of great peace and, uh, and a time of, of a reform. So now this was, you know, this was all published in the late, uh, at least uh, in the late 1700s, if not earlier. So it's not just something that, that we're making up today. But it's very interesting if we think about the, pur the Feast of the Purification. This was, this was the date of, I think, a couple of the apparitions, as I remember. <clears throat> and so it's, it's significant because Mother Mariana was a member of the Conceptionist Order, the Royal Convent of the Immaculate Conception. Now this was in the 16, late 1500s, early 1600s. You know, the dogma wasn't declared until the 1800s. But even so, we, the church still believed in the Immaculate Conception. But then we think about Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. And we think about Our Lady of Lourdes. And we think about Our Lady of Fatima. And the promise that yes, there would be a greater war to come. But that in the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart would triumph. And we were urged to pray the Rosary by Our Lady of Fatima. When we think about how all these things kind of weave together, just like all the events of Christ's life weave together, his, his being born in the cold and suffering, his circumcision shedding his precious blood, his presentation in the temple, the first offering of sacrifice, that all, all of these mysteries of Our Lady's and Our Lord's life are woven together and and, and they're, they're, they're just all so intricately connected. But then we also think about the events of salvation history, before and after, and the age of the church, and then we think about all these messages. Now it's true, Our Lady of, of Quito, Ecuador, Our Lady of Buen Suceso is private revelation. It's approved private revelation. But even so, it's a, it's a sign and a source of hope for us that when things seem so dark, when things just seem such a mess, when things might even seem hopeless for some people, there's always hope. Our Lady, sooner or later, will intervene. And so what do we have to do? Well, we have to follow her example. We have to receive as many blessings as we can. We have to give ourselves generously to God. We have to take your candles home, these blessed candles. We need to be, we need to be vigilant. And, you know, with all this talk of war, shortages, deprivation, um, whatever, follow the economy, whatever, it's really just okay because we know what to do. We know to ha how to have peace in our souls. We have peace in our souls by being in a state of grace, by leading a life of prayer, and by doing penance, and by enjoying these wonderful feasts and processions. 
And I think we're having something good to eat afterward in the, in the uh, Carmody Hall. But there's one other thing we have to consider. The war doesn't just happen like that. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. It begins with, with venial sins. And then, it be, and then it goes to mortal sin. And then unrepentant mortal sin that goes unconfessed and goes from generation to generation to generation. And it builds and builds and builds until it just, until it, it just has to, to explode. And the violence, riots in the street, rebellion, disorders of every kind. All right. But see, then peace begins, just one soul at a time. And little by little, that builds slowly. And then it overcomes the time of war. Now that happens both naturally and, more important, supernaturally. So we know how to have peace in our souls, regardless of what happens. If the economy collapses, if you lose your job, if you lose, you know, if, if you lose things that are dear to you, if the world just falls apart, well, we have to have peace in our souls. Our Lady shows us how, and our Lord provides it for us. So, we need to be vigilant, we need to be prudent, but let us not live in fear. Let us rejoice in this great feast and every feast that comes along. And, well, you've learned how to pray novenas, and there are lots more to come. So I wish you a very blessed feast, and... We'll see you next door after the Mass. Nomine Patris, Filius, Preachus, Sancti, Amen.